I'd like to start off with the Word of God because um, <clears> hope <throat> my voice will uh, last long enough. But where there's a will to wait, but more importantly, where there's a God, He will make sufficient. Father, I thank you for this day you've given us and for this message, this, this wonderful lesson that we heard. We ask that you continue with uh, me and uh, everyone else as we prepare for the the uh, second part of our, uh, our, our this message today. And <clears throat> we ask that you will bless us one and all. Bless that are those that are out of town and bless all the people that we hope will eventually be drawn to this uh, this this church. And so I want to just commit all those things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Gonna get started. And uh, as you can see, the message is about the four attributes of God. I'm in this four different ones, but <clears throat> initially I try to do one sermon and all, but it doesn't give justice to the this study. And so I'm taking them one by one. And today I want to talk about the omniscience of God. And I wonder if that's where they got the worst science. I, I don't know. Maybe so, maybe not. Nobody's ever said. So let us look at the four attributes themselves <clears throat> before we launch into the rest. His uh, omnipotence. That means he's all powerful. He can do everything in, in anything. Omnipresence, he is everywhere. And not just where you where you want him to be, but even places you don't want him to be, he's there. For his own reasons, his own purposes. Omnibulence means that he's very good. Remember the part time, the, the one time uh, they would call the, uh, Jesus that he was good, good master. They kept telling him, and he, and he put a stop to that. And he said, "Don't call me good. There is only one that is really good, and that is the one in heaven, and that is our God." And I thought, "Wow." Omniscience, he knows everything. And that's the one that I want to talk about today. Omniscience, he knows everything. And uh, what does that mean to us? Well, that's what I want to talk about. And that's what I want to get into at this time. So, let's okay, starting off with <clears throat> Psalms 147 verse 5. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. And those of us have been ill recently, and I know that we're, I'm not the only one that gets sick. <clears throat> People get sick and they thought, they think, well, his power is absolute. Why didn't he heal me and get it over with? He has a purpose for everything. He uses the good, and the evil to serve a greater purpose. And you may not like that, but uh, that's the best I can do for that one. So when we say God is omniscient, we mean that he knows all that there is to know. There is nothing that is outside the scope of his conception, understanding, or attention. So he knows everything. There's nothing there's nothing in this world that he doesn't is not aware of. He's very conscientious of that, and he knows what's going on. And and you might which you know some of these things trouble uh, former believers, I guess you call them. They they leave the church or they become agnostic because something happened 
in the in their lives, and God didn't stop it. Maybe I mean, I was I had that concern when my little sister passed away. I think my dad was a new Christian at the time, and I was we were all the family was all worried that because he was a new Christian, and my sister died, maybe he would he would you know think about well. If there was a God, how come he didn't step in and do something? That's what most people would say. Or maybe I'm just going to go ahead and forget about this, th this Christian thing because it's not working. But you know what? To our surprise, he was, uh, he was in, in the kitchen and he was like in, in a very pensive mood. And he said, I got to make sure I stay true because I want to see her again. I, and all of us had a sigh of relief, you know, and he remained faithful until the very end. And I'm sure he's going to see my daughter, my sister eventually. But what I'm getting to is this. That just because God knows things. It doesn't mean that he needs to prevent things. I think he just works through it. So some of us have been injured. I mean, I, I'm not really sure why <clears throat> my issues have come forth, but I, I have faith in him. I think it was Job that said one time, though he slay me, I will serve him. How many people would say that? The opposite was his wife, who said, curse God and die. But you know what? Job was faithful until the very end, and God restored him, and that was great. But you know what? Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So don't ever think that because God knows that he's going to stop it or prevent it, because a lot of people believe very uh, erroneously that only good things happen to good people and only bad things happen to bad people. I think some of them might have thought that in the back of our mind. I got to go to church and or say true, read my Bible because I don't want anything bad to happen. You're setting yourself up for a disappointment. And I'm saying that not just to everybody here, but also anyone that will see this later on. Don't ever put that burden on the Lord. He knows how long we're supposed to live. He knows if we get uh, unhealthy. And maybe he uses that for a trial. Perhaps I'm going through a trial. I'm not sure. But think about what's going in, in, in your life. Everybody has problems. And yet, we must remain faithful because God is faithful. And we know that everything works to the best for those that love the Lord. And so I know that... We have a we only have a short time in this world. But thank God, I think that uh, he eventually he's going to use us for a greater good. Let me back up a bit. OK, we got through that. So he doesn't have to go to school. He doesn't have to learn anything. Uh, some of some some of our students tell us as, as uh, when I was still teaching and I had to retire for health reasons. But anyway, but when we were teaching, my, our students would say, you guys must know everything about technology. And, and I thought, this kid doesn't have it right. So one of the other professors, he said, this is why we have a person that teaches programming and a person that we, that teaches uh, introduction to computers and, and so forth and so on, because we don't know everything. And uh, and so we have to rely on somebody in our team to fill in for the things we don't know. But where I'm going to with that is that God doesn't have to do anything like that. Don't ever think that he, he is three gods and he's gotta be everywhere doing everything he has a he has a, a different facet of himself. You and I have a soul. 
and you and I have a body. And you and I have thoughts that we compose. Are we going to say all of that are three things? <laughs> That's not very practical, is it? So there's a lot to us, and I'm going to get through some of it, but the, the pur purpose of, of this is, is to remember that the Lord is conscientious of what's going on in your life. But I need to throw in a definition. Omniscient is defined as having infinite awareness, understanding, and insight. It is universal and complete knowledge. Uh, you and I don't know what's going what's going on on the other side of the world unless we can see it on TV or the internet. But you know what? We can't even trust that anymore because they only tell you what they want you to know. But God is not like that. He sees everything on every part of the world. And I, I used to think when I was a kid, I can't talk to God now. What if he's busy? What if he's helping somebody else? You know what? He can do that. And, and as I became a computer guy, I realized, you know what? Technology can do a lot of things. It can be everywhere. It could talk to anybody. And they're working on AI that will actually physically walk around telling people everything or making them do things. I don't know. But it seems like everybody that comes up with a new concept eventually turns it into money-making scheme or for some sort of sinister reason. But what I mean is, if we as humans can build technology that sees a lot of things through satellite and whatever, and we're just a tiny speck of creation, if we can do that, imagine God can do that even better. He doesn't need technology. So, you know, I, I, mean, I may be slightly disappointed in saying that I won't have a computer in the next life. And, but that's okay. That's okay because I won't need a computer, you know, and neither will you. So the point is that he has complete knowledge Ezekiel 11, 5 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and he told me to say, This is what the Lord says to the people of Israel. I know what you are saying, for I know every thought that comes to your mind. Wow. It really kind of focus on that one. Here you are trying to pray, and God says, Oh, I know what he's going to talk about. But I, I, and then you might want to say, well, if he already knows, why don't you do something about it right away or, or, or answer my prayer before I even say it? And, the, and I think the answer to that is, and I, this is from my own uh, point of view, my own experience, and it's this. We pray to the Father in the name of Christ not because he doesn't know about it. He does know about it. But he needs to hear it from you and I. So to kind of dwell on that. It's kind of you, like you and as a parent. And look at your little child and say, the little child maybe broke his toy. I'm just giving an example. Maybe broke his toy and you're aware of it, but you don't say anything. I mean, you are tempted to run over there and show him, oh, look what you did or whatever. But it's a learning experience for him and everybody else. So instead, you approach him and, and, we, and see how, how he's doing, he or she. And we hope he or she will fess up and say, I broke this thing. And, you know, and what can you say? Yeah, I'm glad you told me, right? But if they, what if they don't say? And what if they hide it? Well, you know what? There's a lot of adults that do the same thing. They think they can hide things from God. But nothing is hidden from the eye of God. Everything's there 
before him. And everybody thinks that we need to live forever and ever in this life and, and have a great time here and enjoy this life uh, forever and ever. No, God never said that. You have a lifespan. It's kind of like uh, the clock is ticking on us. But unfortunately, it seems to be ticking more and, and faster for some of us more than others. And God is neither surprised by the way the world works itself out. And he's not shocked by the voices, rather the choices we make. All of this, I mean, I'm almost glad in a way to see that there's a lot of performers a lot of movie stars and singers that are coming out and showing themselves to be bisexual, homosexual, whatever. And not only that, but believers in the devil. Uh, I'm kind of prepping that for another time, so I won't get too much into that. But it's happening all over the world. And you might say, well, why doesn't God stop this? He's letting it all play out. People will get either rewarded or punished by the choices they make. So, and who knows, you know, I may say, and the reason I said earlier that I'm glad to see that in a way, in a positive way, is because, well, that's who I'm not going to listen to or watch anymore. And I hope you're okay. You, you accept the fact that we shouldn't support people like that. It's like I said, we think it's okay. It's like uh, Brianna is out there singing, and but she's got a devil's uh, costume with horns on and doing the the devil signal. And a lot of them are like that. And I thought, we, it's got to be some good guys somewhere. And there are. So I'm not giving a cent to any believer in Satan. But what I'm getting here to is this. He's not shocked by it. You and I are shocked. Who would have predicted, maybe as recently as last year, that they will, this, these things that are happening now would have happened? In, in a sense, I, I always hope that maybe the end of the world will come before the people get too crazy. But didn't the Bible say, except there be a great falling away first, then the Lord will not return. It, everything has to play out. And he knows it's going to be bad. And he, but he stops it just in time, he says. And he says, if, even if the very devoted or the very elect, they might fall. So I got to make sure, and I'm paraphrasing, I got to make sure that I don't, I don't let that happen. So you and I, I mean, you know, we, we have the same needs as, as anybody else, whether they're good or evil. And when those things are gone, you know, we're, who do we turn to but God? So no, he's not very shocked with it. And remember that omniscience is a passive in of his providence. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big thing, but I'll try to explain this. But it's he's, uh, God's predetermined purpose via his sovereignty. That is his mastery over all that is. And uh, in that, he, it means that by which priv providence can exist, but neither the engine nor the fuel that brings about his action. Okay, that's a mouthful. But let me say this. In essence, or to, par to kind of narrow it down, God uses providence to uh, stop things, and he does stop things. And I know I should have died many times before, but God had plans for me. I hope he's not done with me, because if he is, you know, uh, it'll be I see you later. But... But I'm not really that not not worried about that. You know, nobody wants to die, but that's providence. God has a master plan, and He says this needs to be carried out completely. 
person over there looks like he or she is going to help me with that on this world. So I need to keep that person going. Oh, he's sick. Well, how can he talk? How can you talk if he if something in his voice got damaged or how can he, uh, you know, walk about and visiting people and things if his body's broken? So he says he interjects his sovereignty. And, uh, and by his providence. So his providence or his master plan quite often is not ours. We want to, <clears throat> people want to get rich, they want to have a big house, and they want to have a better car or whatever. But the reality is that is not part of the plan. If it is in keeping with a master plan that God has, then the uh, Lord will go along with it. But we need to ask the will of God for those things as well. I hope I made that clear. So sovereignty, it is not that God is in control. Everybody says that. Well, sovereignty is, means God is in control. No, 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 no. It means that God inter intercedes for a greater good. And if it's in keeping with what he wants to get accomplished in this world. People in life, you know, even people in, the, in their 90s are saying, I wish I could live longer. God, wow, you got this far, you know, why, why worry about it? But the point is, we're, God never intended what we have here in this world to be permanent or forever. This body is going to break down and, and God is going to have to step in and help us with, uh, by giving us a better body in the future. And I'm fine with that. You know, uh, as they say, or as I, I think about it in my head, you know, but I never voiced it. It was, I can't wait for Job 2.0. <laughs> and what that means, what I'm going with you with that, is that when the next step, that is 2.0. For example, they're talking about having an, we're looking at the internet as 1.0, but the, what, the kind of internet they want to build is going to be the internet 2.0. And so it's the next thing. So the Lord has plans for us. He is sovereign, but it is not that he doesn't, he can't have control. Let's not confuse that. He can be in control if it if it's in keeping with the big master plan. But if it's not, he lets it play out for a greater good. He uses that to test us. He'll use that, use that also to, um, you know, to try, try our faith sometimes, you know. But he's not tempting us, but he's always testing. He knows your heart, too. He knows what's in your heart. Acts 120, I think it's 1224. I don't know where I got too much said in there. And, and they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Know which one of these two you have chosen. And, uh, you know, to, to get a background in, uh, on the story, the apostles only were missing a, a, one apostle or one disciple, as you recall. And it was Judas that betrayed the Lord and killed himself. So they wanted to put somebody in. Uh, it was uh, a, a person named Barnabas. And I do forget the other one. But, and so they drew lots. And they said, Lord, we pray over this. And we pray that you will pick the right one for us. And so they drew the lot for the one that eventually was supposed to replace them. But you know what? You can't go against the will of God. God controls things if it is in keeping what he wants. We never hear about those two people again 
anywhere. So God might say, well, that's a nice, nice suggestion, but I'm going to do what's best. And he, I believe in my heart, and it's not official by anybody else, that God chose uh, Paul to be the last apostle there. And I'm so glad he did. And, and the reason I say that is because he wrote, he, he created so many churches, he helped build so many churches. He wrote half the New Testament. And he was a tremendous inspiration for all of us. So Paul was a very special person. I think I try to model myself after him, but I know I fall short. But anyway, uh, the point is this that I'm getting to is that you and I can do all kinds of things to uh, decide to do something. And if it's in keeping with the Lord, OK, he'll, he'll go along with it. But if it's not, if it's not part of the game plan, he will shut it down. And you either can get angry or get over it. You know what I mean? Because he doesn't care. He is sovereign. And he is doing this for a greater good. Psalms 139, 1 through 3. I apologize for the acts. I think I got trigger happy there. It, I think that four is too much in the middle. But anyways, Psalms 139, 1 to 3. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. See, that we're talking about the heart here. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. So the psalmist, it sounds like David, but who knows, you know, the Psalms were written by different people. But I'm sure David would say this. He knows when you get up in the morning. He knows when you go to bed. He knows what you did in between. And he knows what you've been thinking. I will never know. And uh, don't ever think God, he's a, that he's some sort of magical genie or something. He's not going to give you everything you want, but he will give you what you need. And it may not be what you thought it was. Based on these verses and sins, God knows us so well. Why would we not come to him first? Why do you go to talk to you, uh, your spouse or your friend, your neighbor or an, another brother or sister? Why do, you, why do you go to them first? God knows what's going on with you, so why don't you just go to the one that knows it all without having to explain what happened or what you're worried about and so forth. And that, that uh, when you make the decision without counting on the Lord, it'll turn into a big disaster. Think about all the bad things that have happened in your life and the bad decisions you made. Uh, if you were not part of God's people, you might let, sh let people self-destruct if they want to. But you and I, I know he'll keep us alive until it is our time. And, uh, and he, I know that he will take us unto himself when, when the, the time is finished. But anyway, uh, the Lord knows everything. If you got to go talk to your sister or your brother or whomever about what you're going to, then uh, you're going to have a problem there because you're going to have to explain everything under the sun. And that uh, that doesn't happen with God. You, you know, it's like, think about it. When the next time you pray, just realize that God knows what you're going to say. He's already figured it out and he's aware of it. So do you pray about the problems you're having? Or did you, did somebody else or for somebody else? Or maybe 
you did it on your own. I know most of us ask for prayer, but that doesn't mean we're not praying for ourselves. And it's not it's not foolish to be praying for ourselves. But it's it's wonderful when others pray for us, right? Let's say that God is a God of small things. He likes little things. You know, one time I was talking to a, a scientific a biologist or either a teacher that he teaches science. And this lady, uh, you know, pretty much just taught biology. So I said, and I knew she was an agnostic. You know, she didn't parade about it and she didn't get after me if I prayed before my meal. And and I respected her for that. I think we became pretty good friends. Well, you know, because I, it seemed like she started working at the same time I did. And I can to and this and I told her. And and I was in a subtle way. I said to her, "Well, I I wonder. Uh, have you noticed that there's a lot of little flowers out there?" And none of them are the same. Oh, no, no, no. She said, they are not the same. And every one of them is unique. And they're, they're, they're made especially, they can be big, they can be small, they can have different fragrances or not. They can be replanted or they can just die and wither away. And so I said to her, would you accept the fact that maybe uh, if we were in charge of, of making little flowers for whatever reason, wouldn't uh, we mess up? Maybe we have too many of one kind or too many, uh, too little of one kind or whatever, because that's how we are. We're, we are very repetitive. You know, we, we get into like an uh, automatic mode and we start doing everything else uh, the same because it's a lot easier, isn't it? Kind of like you're, you're working in a factory and you're, you're trying to build furniture and they just put them through the assembly line. They all look the same. And so, and then she says, yeah, you're right about that. I, I think we did that. <laughs> But at some point she knew, she knew I was going somewhere. So I said to her, do you also think they made themselves that way? And she looked at me really carefully and said, I know where you're going. You're right. You can accept that it made itself by itself and all by its own little self, it made itself have a color or have a lifespan or, or have a fragrance or not. And I said, I think. And you realize or I, I, I would hope you would realize in time. That they were created by a higher power. That is in control. She says, I, I got to think about that. I, I'm not sure about that. I said, well, let me ask you this. If I put a computer up on my front lawn or I found a computer in the front lawn. As an analogy. If I find a computer in the front lawn and uh, I came out and I said, wow, look what grew up overnight. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? <clears throat> How did it get there? Then I have to say that we were probably. Uh, not, you know, not the, you know, most people would say in, in reality, no, that was made by a, a, an intelligent being. It didn't make itself. It isn't, didn't just fall together. So uh, Stan and I are, <clears throat> are very logical people because we're scientific. I'm a computer scientist and He's a uh, more into engineering. <clears throat> but the point that I'm getting to is this. Even though I like to think logically, there is a line I do not cross when I should be thinking spiritually. 
And I know where to divide it, but a lot of our scientific folks do not. Let's look at a couple of verses about that. <clears throat> what is the price of two sparrows? This is coming from the Lord Jesus. One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Which will prompt the same question. Well, maybe he shouldn't, if he was knowing that this little bird was dying, why didn't he stop him? If God never let sparrows die, there would be no food or anything for the rest of us. But nevertheless, he cares about the little bird. And he probably feels bad about it. But it's all for a purpose. And then uh, verse 31 of the same chapter don't be afraid you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. So it, that's an awesome thing if you think about it. We're more important to him than birds. And Psalm 56 verse 8, you number my wanderings, my tears into your bottle. And are they not written in your book? Well, the truth of the matter is, yes, God has recorded everything. And he, he, I think the Lord must have really hurt and felt very anxious to see his son dying. His only son, begotten son. And he was dying and he saw people whipping him and, and stabbing him and hanging upon a cross. How do you think he feels? So then you're going to that, that if I ask the question, well, why didn't he stop it? All right. And then the answer is there was a greater purpose. And that was that he was sacrificing himself for us so that so many, many people would be saved. So the next time you think, why did this happen to me? And you know what? The, the Lord is more concerned about our future than he's thinking about this old body. He knows about it and he hurts about it for us. He, he feels sorry for us. But he lets, let us go through it and maybe some greater good will come. Certainly won't be for, uh, for the rest of the world, but for our own purposes maybe. Uh, believe it or not, it's, I'm trying to wrap up soon. God is very detailed oriented. You know what that means? For one thing, I'm not. I'm not detail oriented. I look at the, the big picture of everything. But most people, some people are. And certainly the Lord is. So 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your care about upon him for he cares for you. He doesn't just care for me, he cares for you too. And so you may as well trust in the Lord. So what makes us think that we're not important to God? And so if we go through things, whether it's physical, financial, or maybe uh, relationships, just realize God is going to use that for a greater good. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a test. Or maybe it is something that's making you stronger. You know, if all the bad things stop happen, never happened, we will be very different people, extremely different people. We would not be who we are today. I can assure you that we, all of us, are a byproduct of all the bad things that happen, not just the good things, maybe some of the good things, but a lot of the bad things. But I, I can tell you now because I, I'm older, I, I know why some of the things that happened to me had a purpose too. And so I thought, well, I see, you know, that same God that got me through that for a better purpose and I can see what it is now, is still here and he's still aware of me and he still cares for me. So if he thinks about if he cares about all these small small little creatures 
imagine how much is being made, those being made in this image. So we are made in God's image. And if we're made in God's image, then aren't we more special to the Lord? I would think so, but don't think you're a mini God. Don't let anybody tell you you're a little God or nothing. Uh, it's kind of like some people look at their child and they say, oh, that's a mini me. Well, they might look like you, but they're not you at all. Since God cares for us and loves us so completely, will he not do the best for us? And remember, as I said before, maybe the best for us is not what you're expecting. Maybe it's not in keeping with your plans, but it's definitely for a greater good. And if that's what is going to happen, that's fine. Do you think the disciples, I think all of them except John perhaps, were actually crucified or killed in some manner? But, you know what? Do you think they, they felt, oh, we're dying? I, I give I, I, I give up on faith. I give up uh, following God or trusting in the Lord. I don't think they did that at all. In fact, Peter himself, who was a, probably a handful because he was a lot younger, uh, and and I and I I'll tell you this little story, but I'm not going. I don't know for sure if it happened, but I wrote I read somewhere where they said that Peter did not want to be hung on the cross the same way Jesus did. He wanted to be hung upside down because he said, I am not worthy to die like my Savior. Who thinks about things like that? Uh, if we were in that position, we would be, the last thing in our mind was that, okay, kill me this way instead of that way. But he knew he was dying, but he didn't care. He was okay with it because it was for a greater good. And research estimates that there, uh, I think I'm getting, uh, I'm going to, I'm getting, I'm jumping to the next thing. I'll go back to it and show you. Anyway, he, he isn't the God of small things. Look at this cell right there. And I'm, I'm about halfway through, but that, you know, it's getting kind of lengthy and I'm, I don't want to push my voice too much. Look at this cell here. And then look at the solar system. Dig up a YouTube on the solar system. They'll tell you everything is in balance. No planets collide and that everything has, all of these plans are turning in a, a certain uh, circumference and, and uh, so they can have their own days and years and whatnot. We don't even know if there's anybody else out there, but who knows? But the purpose, the point is this, that is what's going on in your body. The same God that made all this made you. Look at the little sun we have in there. <laughs> and uh, maybe these are kind of weird looking planets, but you know what, we're not exactly like that. But all of these little things that are around the, the nucleus, which is the center of everything, and you know the sun is our nucleus in our, plan, uh, in our solar system. Wouldn't you think that God really cares about every little thing about us? And I'll throw back what I what I was saying before. Research estimates that there are about 30 trillion human cells in the average person. 30 trillion. So we got 30 trillion of those. I don't know. I there might be more planets in us than these out there, but who knows why God is doing that? But we're we're okay with that. And uh, probably the last thing I want to talk about is this. It's, well, I say this God is a small thing. And I put this stomach there. And uh, I think it's because I, I was, um, I, I got consult, con, uh, consultation for my GERD. And I won't go into a lot of details. But this is the picture that the um, uh, gastroenter, gastroenterologist was showing me. And I found it on the, on the web. 
And he said that this is where you are right now. And, and I asked my problem. And then he came back to it in a minute. And I'll get back to it in a minute myself. Sometimes we don't come to the Lord because our, our we come because we think it's, we don't want to come because we think it's too trivial. Well, I don't want to bother God with that. I just go with the big things. But what I want to focus this on this, our stomach acid is called hydrochloric acid. That is all inside of that stomach of ours. And this acid could melt most metals. And, and he told me that too, but he said, don't swallow any nickels though. <laughs> I said, I'm too old for that. And he said, but he says, and so getting back to my condition, and I think it applies to you too, in some way, you see this little, there's this, all this acid here, the food comes down this tube, the esophagus, gets into the tummy, and there the acid burns it up and everything's fine. But the, and when that happens, then this little valve closes. The food is already down and uh, the door closed most of the time. In my case, it's still open. So now, now and then some of this stomach acid is going up here. So if you hear me gravelly, that's what it is. But they're going to they're planning a procedure and I don't know what time it, it is, but they in essence. He says so all because I tell you, so what are you going to do? We're just going to go inside you and close that little door. See how I circled there. We're going to close that little door. I know you told me what the name of it was, but I, I forget, but it doesn't really matter anyway. But the reason I bring that up. Is that. The, re the reality is that is a lot of things to think about. Because think about that acid. Why does if it can burn metal? Why does it burn us? Why don't things start leaking out of our stomach? He put a special membrane to protect us that covers the stomach. We are a miracle. As people, we are probably one of his greatest creations. I just say one of us because we are so complex that I can't imagine we did ourselves or that we came out of an amoeba, an amoeba or some sort of cell and uh, and then suddenly we came to life. And also, and this is what you might tell, you might sound like, oh, this is a fairy tale. No, I heard this in school. And some, some people, I got these. And one of the guys behind me, he says, this person is cracked. <laughs> but anyway, but she went on to say, so this little cell divided itself into different things. One became a fish, one became another animal, and one became a... Uh, uh, you know, an ape and we evolved from the apes. I said, that's too much. Absolutely too much. It's, it goes back to the analogy that I was telling a while ago. We are more complex than any computer in the world. And I can assure you, I can put one together, but I cannot build it every little facet of it. But God is a small, the uh, God of small things. And he's thought of everything about that. And I just use these uh, physical analogies, I think because Jesus also, we're trying to make analogies for people that they could relate to. And so when I think about the cells, I think we're, you know, they, they, they'll tell you, the you know, doctor will tell you, they, they check for your red cells and white cells and all these other things. But, and then the stomach is also very complex. We haven't even got into the brain. I, that's a whole hour on that one. 
in fact, one, uh, one, one person, one doctor who uh, worked on patients in their brain, I, I forgot what the title of that is, he had, but he said, we're looking around in the planets for, for something new, something special. This brain is more complicated than anything you can imagine. So I won't go into detail about that, but I will tell you that he said, it is, and this is a science, uh, this was a, uh, a doctor who was also a scientist and a Christian. Not to be confused with Christian scientists because they go off on another tangent. No, he's a Christian that is a scientist. And he said, maybe the world doesn't see this, but I'll tell you what, I know and you know, so give God the glory. He says, I go in there, try to fix things a little bit, but there's so much stuff in there. I don't, should we take that out or not? I don't know, is that, is that something good? No, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I will conclude with that. I just had a, well, actually, let me get to the conclusion then. <laughs> I, didn't, I thought I was, I had a little more, but let me just conclude. So remember that omniscience, omniscience, he knows everything. So before you pray for someone or other concerns, remember that God already knows. He knows your heart. He knows what's in your heart. But we're not talking about the heart itself. It, we're talking about the spirit in you, the drive that you have, the things that make you who you are. It isn't a physical thing. It's a, it's a heart of your soul. And he cares about the small things or things that we think are trivial. Nothing is trivial to God. He makes the little the cells and and little flowers and whatever else, and he makes planets. To him, it's all the same. The little things that, and big things are, are are the same to him, but to us, they're not they're they're not equal. We all think the little ones and the big ones, you know, are uh, you know are hard to understand on, on their own. And so we tend to separate them. So anyway, that concludes. But um, I'm going to go ahead and close with a prayer on this. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to bless us throughout this day. And to give us the rest that often escapes us. Again, another prayer for Esther's sister that you'll be with her at this time. We know that she's probably tending to her right now. And uh, I think Stan can, can uh, we can conclude that we know that she's very distraught about it. So we pray for her too. We pray that she will have faith and confidence in a God that cares about all of us. But we know that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And for that, we, we thank you for the grace that you offer us. And so we ask that you'll bless everyone here and all those that may read or see this uh, message later on. And I pray, Lord, that you will forgive our sins daily because we make mistakes daily because we're so human, but we try to get up again and do better. And for that, I'm grateful for the, uh, the second chances you, you provide. And so I ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, to whom I give all honor and glory. Amen.